Many people think AI is a recent invention, but it is not. In 2026, it will turn 70 years old. But autonomous cars are new, right? Also not. The first driverless car hit the roads of New York City in 1925. That's almost 100 years ago. Today we talk about the hype, the myths and little pieces of history of artificial intelligence. Very welcome to Code Red, Technology, Madness and the Future of Humanity. The monthly podcast for people who are pissed off about technology going rogue, want to do something about it and wish to use technology in a positive way to create a better future for humanity. My name is Ursula Isin, I'm the founder and CEO of Vienna-based Red Swan, and it's my pleasure to co-host this videocast with Silicon Valley-based 354-fold patent holder, the man, the myth, the idea-generating machine, Chris Kalabuk. <laughs> Not a legend yet, but thank you for that. <laughs> legend. <laughs> Very welcome, Chris, to the show. Thank you so much. It's great. It's always a pleasure to be on the show with you, Ursula. The pleasure is on my side. I recently heard someone say in a keynote, autonomous cars are the next big thing in AI. Well, this next big thing was invented almost 100 years ago. Let's step back in time to 1925 when the inventor Francis P. Houdina astounded New York City with a groundbreaking invention, the first radio-controlled self-driving car, also coined the American Wonder. Radio waves, transmitted from a trailing vehicle, guided the driverless car on its journey through, the, through New York City. Two sets of waves captured by antenna on the Wanda's sleek frame work the magic, operating the steering wheel, clutch, brake, gears, and even the horn. It was pure wizardry. But almost 100 years later, autonomous driving still has an acceptance problem. People fear giving up their human agency and freedom of choice. And rightfully so. If we put AI in the driver's seat of our lives, I mean, literally, the risk of losing the ability to think for ourselves is very real. In fact, many people have already lost the capability of navigating through the city without their smartphones. And with the ability to navigate through the world, we also lose the ability to overcome problems and find solutions. Thus, we could easily drift into an absolute nightmare scenario. So let me ask you, Chris, why would we even need driverless cars? Because t p human beings are terrible drivers. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> it's pretty simple, actually. <laughs> the, the thing about... Um, driving is that it's a very structured thing. It's kind of like playing chess, right? So there's rules of the road. And human beings are terrible at following rules. They're absolutely awful at following rules, whereas AI follows rules to a T. Mm. So anything that requires rule following, AI is fantastic at. Mm. Because AI will always stop at that stop sign. It will never run through the stop sign. It will never run through a red light. It will never go, oh, man, I am late to pick up my kid. I got to run through that red light or I got to go faster. It'll never do that because it follows the rules. And driving, believe it or not, I mean, obviously driving itself is, is a human activity now. Hmm. But I think we would probably reduce fatalities and injuries on the road a lot if we just let the, let the cars take over. Because it's 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 a game of rules, and AI does great at anything mm -hmm. that has to do with rules. But I have a question for you on that example that you yes. gave. Was that radio control? Did somebody actually have to control it, or did the car literally autonomously move around the city? The other car con controlled it, actually. Okay, so there was a there was some control from a human being somewhere so there was a human being somewhere controlling it it was, it was ra I guess radio so. i think as far as i understood it <laughs> there was still a human being steering it but still it, very it, very impressive i'm sure it seemed to to drive on its own yes and it's it's an, among autonomous car experts it's recognized as the birth of autonomous cars fantastic yes i love it but yeah if you ask me the sooner we get human beings off the road the better <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. So follow the rules. Um, of course, there can also um, 
um, create problems because if you always follow the rules and there are exceptions, as you as you just said, human beings are terrible in following rules and we are part of this world, right? So we might get in the way of these rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm a, I'm a I'm, the problem is is that you either have all human drivers or you have all AI drivers. Yeah, I think this in between part is, danger, is the right? problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I also think I, I think in between can be really, really dangerous because the car, the um, the autonomous car, always follows the rules, and um, we as human beings don't follow the rules. So this can be a real problem. So at the moment, it actually could be very dangerous, right? Yeah, absolutely, and that's the reason why it's taken so long for autonomous vehicles to to work mm -hmm. because they have to try and figure out what to do in these situations that are outside of the boundaries of the rules. When, when human beings jaywalk or fall asleep at the wheel or whatever. So there's things that human beings do that have not been programmed in. And that's one of the biggest failings of AI is that it'll only do what's already been done. Mm. So it, it, works on the, yes. it works on history. Yeah. It works on what's yeah. happened before. So it's experience, it works on experience, but it doesn't work on intuition or surprise, right? Yes. It can't. It has a real problem with surprise. It doesn't know how to handle surprise. We are also not so good in handling surprise, to be honest. <laughs> Some of us are better than others. Yes. We like good surprises, but we are not so good in handling not so good yeah. surprises. Um, this leads me to the next point. You already mentioned it. Uh, it's... Um, Professor Mark Bishop with the University of London says he's much more concerned with artificial stupidity than with artificial <laughs> intelligence. But let's assume that there is such a thing as intelligence out there. What is artificial intelligence? It is talked about everywhere and every day. And so we just kind of assume everyone kind of knows what we mean when we talk about it. I recently asked an audience of 150 people to lift their hand if they were able to define what AI really is. Almost no one lifted their hand. Can you help us out, Chris? What is artificial <laughs> intelligence and why would we need it in our lives? Well, first of all, the word artificial is easy enough to figure out, right? Hmm. But the word intelligence, impossible. <laughs> we still don't really know what intelligence is. So I think that might be one of the reasons why no one raised their hand because they can't define the intelligence part mm -hmm. of artificial intelligence. But recently, artificial intelligence has been has been really connected with generative AI. So it's taking large language models, which is huge, huge, huge databases of, of human history and thought and things that we've already done, and then recombining them in new ways that we expect them to be recombined. So we would ask it a question, and it would recombine bits of what we've already said, what other human beings have already said, in a way that makes it feel as if you're actually talking to a human being. So we're, we sense that we're, talking, that we're talking to something intelligent, when really it's just sort of a combination of things that have already been said before, what it expects us to say. Mm. That's why one of the best examples of generative AI or definitions of generative AI is that it's like a super augmented autocorrect. So it works just like <laughs> autocorrect does on your phone, but it's really, really good mm. at predicting what the next word is going to be in that sentence. And mm. it's so good at it that it makes you think, wow, I'm talking to another human being. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's where generative AI, but AI itself, like you said, has been going around. It's been around for a hundred years. Um, the uh, most of the AI research has started was started in the seventies. It came and went and, and has gone through so many iterations. It's so funny. On my own show, I talk about some people say, "Oh, I've been in AI for twenty years. I've been in AI for thirty years." And I said, "Are you you're telling me it wasn't born last year?" Because <laughs> it sounds as if it just became. It just Turn, became existent a year ago yes. when ChatGPT yes. came out. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's been around for a really, really long time. And we've been struggling with this for the longest time. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I ask anyone out there, define what intelligence is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we think we know what it is. It's kind of like art. We know, we know what it is when we see it. <laughs> we'll define, yes, we, I think that's art. I think, I'm not sure if that's art. But intelligence I think fr from our perspective is, does it feel and look like a human being? It's like the Turing test, right? Mm -hmm. The Turing test is, if this thing, if this machine 
can sound and act and be and feel human, then we consider it intelligence. But the reality is, like I said, behind it all, it's really just a super attenuated autocorrect that's putting together words and phrases that we've already said, like human beings have already said, and presenting them to us. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why it, it hallucinates, because it doesn't really know what it's doing. It's just pulling together a bunch of stuff that we've done before and regurgitating at us. I think there are um, two parties here now. The one is uh, there's this myth, AI is kind of a god and it will overtake the world, etc. Um, others say, well, when in reality, it's a more fancy word for statistics. <laughs> so mm -hmm. what's the difference between statistics and machine learning? Is there a difference? Well, not really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> because, everyone. Because everyone who really it, knows says that. Yeah, and it's it. There's nothing godlike behind it. That's why people feel that there's something godlike behind it. Mm -hmm. And people, I think, part of it is the whole what's happened with media. The me media needs to have a negative story because human beings respond with more views and clicks and eyeballs looking at negative stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you they see something. That could be an amazing breakthrough because there's tons of amazing breakthroughs that AI is doing on the on the medical front, on the education front. There's tons of amazing good things that AI is doing. Hmm. But no, they forget about that. They think about, oh, look at the Terminators coming in to destroy us all, or it's going to control drones and it's hmm. going to kill all people. So the negative news is just rampant because they take whatever's the hottest thing and they spin it in a negative fashion. And they put it in front of us and they say, well, this is what's going to happen. So there's really, there's nothing back there. And the other thing I like people to understand is that it is us. AI, generative AI is us. This is all us human beings. Uh, our output has been fed into the machine. That's what a large language model is. It is a huge database of things that human beings have already said. So it's us. So it's when you're talking to ChatGPT, you're talking to... A, a piece of humanity yeah so that's it's that's, not a god <laughs> that's true yes it's not a god it's humanity it's it's us it's us that makes it very tangible and relatable i, I like that yeah but a lot of people don't they don't, they'll see that they think it's something beyond us and it's not it's it's, it's us right now yeah yeah Let, let's uh, keep it down to earth and uh, let's come back to the history of AI. Many people think, as we said, it was invented maybe three, five, or at most 15 years ago. Uh, that's not even close. I already mentioned that AI is not a recent invention and that it will turn 70 years old in 2026. But what's actually the history behind it? In August 1955, the term artificial intelligence was coined in a proposal for a two-month, 10-man study on artificial intelligence submitted by Dartmouth College, Harvard University, IBM, and the Bell Telephone Laboratories. The workshop, which took place a year later in July and August 1956, is generally considered as the official birthday of the new field. But, and I like this very much, but some go even Back further. The earliest date I found is 1308. That's 715 years wow. ago. Wow. <laughs> when the Catalan poet and theologian Ramon Yul published his magnum opus, Ars Generalis Ultima, the ultimate general art. In his work, Yul perfected his, perfected his method of using paper-based mechanical means to create new knowledge and insights through the combination of concepts. And this ancient innovation paved the way for a whole new era of intellectual exploration. So I would like to repeat this because I think this is a great explanation um, and a great concept to create new knowledge and insights through the combination of concepts. I think this is, you said AI is us, and this is very human. That's the human spirit. What do you think, Chris? Well, that kind of makes me happy and sad at the same time. Because, <laughs> <Explain>. <laughs> because that's, that is, you basically have described what generative AI is. It's something that was invented in, what would you say, 1305 or something oh, like that? 1308. So we've actually had generative AI for 700 years or 700, almost seven, over 700 years. And 
it took this long to actually become useful. <laughs> so I, yeah. I feel sad that <laughs> I feel sad that somebody invented it in the 1300s and it's taken till the 20 uh, the the 2200s or what is it now the tw- 2020s to become real. Mm. But uh uh yeah, no no, that's exactly right. You're exactly right. And I think the thing that the biggest breakthrough really the reason why this is happening today is is the ability to compute. We haven't had Mm. this level of computability. So in the last maybe five, 10 years or so, our ability to just scale up compute resources has just become huge. Yeah, yeah. And that is the thing that has driven these advances in AI. Because we couldn't do that before. In the 70s, all all of these concepts that we're talking about today have all been thought about. We all came up, the ideas have been have been come up with where they came up, they were, they were invented in the 1300s. They've been regurgitated in the 1970s. All these things have been going on and on. And the, the thing is, is that technology hasn't caught up with the ideas. And it's finally caught up to the point where it, we've created something that appears to be intelligent and mm-hmm. is, and can happen immediately. Cause I can imagine a drawing room in the 1300s where, <laughs> You actually have somebody using this con- these concepts that you were just talking about, creating generative AI responses to questions. Yes. They could conceivably do that by hand manually, but they just couldn't do it at scale. And we're basically doing the exact same thing, except we're now doing it at scale with huge machines in the background. Yes. So... It makes me sad that it took 700 years, but I'm happy that it's happening now. <laughs> well, compared to the development and evolution of the universe, that's nothing. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's just a blink of an eye. <laughs> Drop in the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so it was still fast. <laughs> uh, you already mentioned the 70s. What we are living uh, through today is not the first AI hype. In its almost 70 years of existence, there were many booms and busts in its developments. In the 1970s, there was even a period called the AI winter. The hype went down because the US had withdrawn funding from the AI research. Why do you think, Chris, AI made a comeback and is such a hype now? Well, there was always, there was always work in AI. Always, there was always work. work. Work was ongoing, especially in the computer vision space, machine learning spaces. All of that stuff was ongoing. We just didn't have the compute power to be able to do the kind of things that we're doing today. And that's why I was saying is that in the last five, 10 years, we've been able to uh, double, triple, quadruple, you know, exponentially grow the ability to have compute power and just wait until we see quantum computers come online with this because that 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 might be that might be the thing that brings us actual general intelligence artificial general intelligence where we do have machines that can act so much like human beings that we can't tell the difference but that was the key piece was that we needed the technology we need the scalability we needed the raw compute power because that's the big difference between human beings and machines is that we can make connections and intuit things with very little data. We know very little. In fact, I was reading somewhere the other day that the amount of data that we that we take in through our eyes and all of our senses is minuscule compared to the amount of data that AIs can take in. But so we can but we can make all sorts of great intuitive decisions based on very little data whereas AI needs tons, tons of data. Of it data. needs huge 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 amounts of data mm-hmm. to come out with anything that even resembles a human like response. So until we got to that point where the technology was able to expand, until we got to that scale of, of processing power, we weren't able to do anything that would have been useful. And now we've got that scale of processing power, and then you couple it with a, hum- a very human-like interface. So they were genius when they used the this chat interface to initially pull this out, because it is how normal human beings communicate. This is how we talk. We talk to each other. We chat with each other. We, we send text messages to each other. So using that as the interface became, that's what really made it accessible to a lot of people. Yes, but it's not new. And uh, the fantasy, <laughs> the fantasy not, definitely not new. <laughs> the fantasy of intelligent machines is frequently portrayed in books and films. You already mentioned the Terminator. Uh, 
I found a very interesting chat GTP, for example, was already described in a famous novel dating back to the year 1726. That's almost 300 years ago. It was Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, which includes a description of the engine, a machine on the island of Laputa described as a project for improving speculative knowledge by practical and mechanical operations. By using it, the most ignorant person at a reasonable charge and with a little bodily labor may write books in philosophy, poetry, politics, law, mathematics, and theology with the least assistance of genius or study. Isn't that exactly what ChatGTP is that, that is, is capable exactly of? right. That's it, exactly right. Isn't that's it? That's exactly right. It's <laughs> so exactly... All of this stuff has happened before. <laughs> yes. And I mean, 300 years, years ago. ago, 300 years ago, this was already described and now we, we have it. Oh. <laughs> That's why I think it's really important for us to actually do things like this. So even if we don't have the technology or the ability to actually do any of this stuff, it's important for us to think about it I, yes. and record it, yes. right? Because even if we're not doing it now, someone might do it 300, 400, 500, 700 years from now. <laughs> But it's important for us to actually get it down because it might spark an idea at some yes. point in the future. So instead of just keeping it in and not thinking about it, Get it out there in the open. And if somebody sees it, it's kind of like, you know, Star Trek communicators where they were thought of and then they were invented mm -hmm. 20, 30 years later. So it's the same thing with all of these things is that if we put the paradigms out there in the world and we record them, then you may not necessarily be uh, seeing it this generation. Generations and generations from now, we'll look, go back and look at it and go, wait, I can build that today. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's always good to get it out there. Yes. So our imagination is really very powerful. It can can bring uh, bring things into this world. Uh, the idea to have a conversation with a chatbot is also neither new nor was it invented by OpenAI with ChatGTP. Let's talk about Eliza. In 1966, <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Weizenbaum, a researcher with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, developed a program called Eliza. This program is able to take the role of a psychotherapist and conduct a dialogue with the patient. I remember you saying ChatGTP is kind of your new friend, or your wife was saying that. Does it also serve as your psychotherapist? Sometimes, <laughs> some days. <laughs> it used to, not so much anymore, because uh, oh. I, I've been using it for other things. But uh, no, I remember Eliza very well, because I used to, one of my very first experiences was on a Commodore PET computer. And it was with the green screen and the big keyboard, the chiclet keyboards and stuff like that. And yeah, I remember it was at a, a department store in downtown Toronto, where I used to live. And I would go down there and they just had the computer there and they didn't know what to do with it. So they just had it sitting on the counter and people could come up to it and use it. And Eliza was on the, or a, an instance of Eliza was on the machine and I would have conversations with it all the time. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic, but it always failed, right? Where, it would always, it would always it fail? fail. Well, it would get to the point where it asks you the same question. So how do you feel? And you say, well, you know, I feel kind of down today. Well, Why do you feel down? And it, it was just like, it would be the, the, what is it? The stereotypical therapist just respond every, to every answer with a question. Oh, oh, so it would yeah, just yeah. take your, it would just take what you just said and it would respond with your question. Well, why do you feel that? Oh, because of this. Oh, why do you feel that? So they would just continuously do that. And eventually it would kind of wear on you and go, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't right. <laughs> and then at that same department store, they had a, a robot, Right. And you could talk to the robot and it's, it would speak back to you. And it was basically somebody in another room talking to you through the robot to make it sound as if it was a real human being. It's kind of like the mechanical Turk oh. where, <laughs> you know, it looks like you're, it's a robot, but it's actually a human that being a behind, human it all. behind it all. Yeah. And if you think about it, we, this is what ChatGPT is. This is what all of this generative AI is. It's, it's a way more sophisticated version of the me mechanical Turk because It takes bits and pieces of what people have said before and, and presents them to you. It just makes the decision. So instead of a human being making the decision of what to present to you, mm. it's a machine making a decision of, of what to present to you. So really, it's kind of like a automated mechanical Turk. <laughs> yes. 
Let's come back to the stupidity of AI. <laughs> AI mm -hmm. is feeding off of our patterns. That would be good news if you were showcasing particularly good behavior towards other human beings and our surrounding in general. But we don't. Human relationships are often based on zero-sum games, I win, you lose, and the willingness to harm others. Our relationship with technology is also often based on these zero-sum games. So how would you describe your relationship with technology and with other human beings? What do you do for self-awareness in order to feed AI with good patterns instead of neurotic <laughs> ones? <laughs> I only tell it good things. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, is that it's, it's our own fault. Everything comes back to our own fault. Mm. Is it what it's do we mirror, feed right? into the machine? It's a mirror. Yeah, it's a mirror. What, what are we feeding into the machine? People say that AI hallucinates. Well, what did we tell it? It's kind of like all of these things. It's it, technology. It's so funny how people get angry at technology when the technology is really stupid. It doesn't really know anything. <laughs> it only knows what we've told it. So mm -hmm. if we, it's the garbage in, garbage out. If we yeah. tell it terrible things, if we say, be nasty, if we feed all sorts of horrible information into it, we're going to get horrible information out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's we really need to be the ones responsible. We have to be responsible for it. I mean, think of it as raising a child. We're raising a child. And if you feed it negative vibes, those negative vibes are going to bounce back. And what we've been doing in our <clears throat> rush to make it in intelligent enough to know everything, we've just fed everything into it. So we've mm -hmm. fed fiction, we've fed uh, fact, we've fed all of this stuff into it. And it's it hallucinates because it doesn't know what's real. It has no idea, to no, no way to know what's real. And we have to go back into it and say, well, this is real, this is not real. This happened, mm -hmm. this didn't actually happen. So... It's up to us to be responsible about how we train the AI because that's that's the, that's the biggest part of it is there has to be training. And what you don't see when you're sitting in front of ChatGPT entering stuff is that there's thousands of people back there that are training the AI to respond this way and that way. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I'm uh, kind of unhappy about what's happening with AI is that... <clears throat> It's like with any of these technologies, there's a period of time when it's released and it does all sorts of amazing, interesting, out of the box things. And then they start putting controls on it because they don't, they go, whoa, we don't want this thing to be saying this or that, even though it might be saying something really interesting. And the more controls that they put on something, then the less and less yeah, it's, capability it's it has to be able to, yeah, to be able to do stuff for us out of the box. Yeah. That's why I always... I always advocate for not human AI. I want superhuman AI. I want AI to be better than us as opposed mm. to be just like us. Yes. One AI expert once told me that in Japan, people assume that everything has consciousness. The table, your smartphone, your laptop, everything. So yep. they advise to treat everything and everyone with respect. I think that's a good advice in general. And if it just so happens that AI takes over the world, you're safe because you treated it well and in the first in the first place and it learned this pattern from you. Yeah. Oh, it will at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> With this hopeful outlook, I would like to close our conversation today. Thank you very much for the insightful conversation, Chris. As always, it was a pleasure. Is there anything you would like to, to uh, add for our audience to know? Um, other than just reiterating that we have to remember that AI is us. It's a reflection on us. It's a mirror of us. And we need to be a responsible parent and feed it with the right information so that it can make the right decisions and not just give it everything. We need to we need to guide it. We need to help it because at some point it's going to and hopefully be better than us because we need AI. There's some problems in the world. There's some issues in the world that are so hairy. It's almost impossible for human beings to figure a way out. We need to be able to bring AI in as a partner and go, can you help us with this problem? What can we do that maybe we haven't thought about based on the, all of the, everything that you know? Maybe there's a solution in there that we haven't thought about yet. It's happening in medicine. It's happening in, in all sorts of fields. Let's apply it to some of the, our biggest problems and see what it comes up with. Thank you for that. 
So that's it for this episode. Lovely people, thank you for watching Code Red, Technology Madness and the Future of Humanity. If you liked it, please like and subscribe. Do you know three people who would also enjoy the content? Then share it with them. All episodes are publicly available and free of charge. You're more a reader than a listener, then feel free to subscribe to the written Code Red column on coderad by redswan.substack.com. In any case, let me thank you for taking the time and for your bravery to change the world by starting with yourself. I wish you a good day or a good night, and in any case, a good life. See you next time.